Well, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, it's good to see you this morning, and uh, I ask that you would pull out those Bibles in front of you, turn them to John chapter 8, which is the focal point of our message this morning. We'll sort of look at the whole chapter, in essence, for a portion of of our message this morning. Well, when you think of great reformers of America and throughout our world, who are some of the people that you think of? Some of the people that instantaneously came to my mind this week, George Washington, and others who led the fight for our freedom of national independence. Then there was Abe Lincoln who fought so hard for the personal freedom of emancipating slaves, abolishing slavery in our United States. You could hear the battle cry of those slaves, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty we're free at last. Then I could think of Martin Luther King Jr. back in the 1960s, fighting for racial freedom and equality, speaking about not how we're judged upon the color of our skin, but how we're judged by our inner personal character. Then I can think about George Bush standing on a pile of rubble there in New York City in 2001, proclaiming freedom for the United States from terrorist attacks that we will indeed fight back. Well, throughout the timeline of America's history, our beloved country has indeed had many agents of change, many powerful and influential reformers. And the debate can go on who would be the greatest reformer, but reformer. But let me sort of bring three more into the mix for you this morning as we close out our sermon series. For if you've been paying the slightest bit of attention over the past month, you'd know uh, what we've been speaking about is the course as a nation that we are on politically, economically, socially, and spiritually. So during the construction of a constitution that the newly formed United States would be determined to live by, Thomas Jefferson pins these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Words that no doubt reformed many within our own country. Now hear the words of Martin Luther defending his premise of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone, as he calmly stood up and spoke at the Diet of Worms in 1521. This is what he said. I cannot and will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Words that no doubt reformed many within the church and the faithful believers. And then there is yet one more reformer whose words of truth we look at this morning, spoken to a gathering of Jewish believers who so dearly wanted to follow him. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Words that no doubt reformed many within this world over the course of centuries. So let's explore together on this Reformation morning what this one verse, the truth that this one verse gives to us, what it has to offer, these simple yet profound words that Jesus speaks, and how these words are the greatest Reformation that this world has and will ever see. So if you open up with me to the Bible's John chapter 8, you'll see that knowing the context around in which Jesus is saying this is very important. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of chapter 8 there, and you'll see that Jesus is appearing in the temple courts, and he's gathering with throngs of people who, are, who have gathered around to hear him, and he's sitting down and he's teaching them. Now the religious leaders are trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to make Jesus say something that he shouldn't, but we know that he doesn't take that bait. With stones in their hands, ready to be used with the intent to kill, Jesus draws a line in the sand and says, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And one by one, they exit until only Jesus is face to face with that adulterous woman. And he says, has no one condemned you? Then neither do I. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus then returns to teaching the people there, and once again, the religious leaders butt in and challenge him. Your testimony's not valid, but Jesus responds, I'm one who testifies for myself. My witness is the Father who sent me. Well, this doesn't seem to appease those accusers of his. Where is your Father? Really, who are you, Jesus, they ask. Jesus responds, if you knew me, you would know my Father as well. He who sent me is reliable, and what I've heard from him, I now tell the world. 
Well, the religious leaders stand there a bit stunned. They're not understanding one iota, one bit of what Jesus is talking about, but the scriptures say this. Nevertheless, as Jesus continued to speak, many people put their faith in him. And that's when Jesus turns to those believers at what he is saying, and he ushers in these new powerful words of the Reformation. If you hold to my teaching, then you are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So that's the context before what Jesus says. But the context right after is equally important. As we continue on in that chapter, you see that these believing Jews, they don't fully understand what freedom he's talking about. We're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone. So how is it that you can say that we would be set free? Oh, well, things are heating up for sure. The stakes are being raised. Things are getting interesting. The Jews are are using their lineage to Abraham as their poster boy of defense. We don't need to be set free. We've never been enslaved. We never will be. But first of all, these Jews don't understand their bondage to Roman rule that they've been placed, and they're only free to the limits that the authorities have placed on them. But even more so, they don't understand the freedom of their souls. So as Jesus always seems to do, he comes up and responds quickly. I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And this debate, this argument, it carries on until they actually have stones in their hands ready with the intent to stone Jesus because they they are so irate at what he's saying. But the scriptures say this, Jesus hides himself and goes away from the temple grounds. Now, beloveds of Jesus, you know that there's one common thread each one of us share. People of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every race, that we all have in common, and that's our sinful human nature. We are all fallen creatures. Paul, the apostle Paul says today in God's word, there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes by Jesus Christ. See, when it comes time for you and I to confront our sinful, fallen human natures, there's often two fundamental mistakes that we make. The first mistake we make is to do what the Jews we just heard and read about did, to get selective amnesia, to conveniently deny or or forget, to, to forget that the woman standing right there in front of them to be stoned, that sinner is just like you and me, in need of God's grace, in need of God's forgiveness. We forget that we're slaves to sin, needing to be freed. We forget to that before God and one another that we are bound by our sin. But a second tragic mistake that we make is often that we think that we can deal with this problem and issue of sin on our own. You see, uh, we, we believe that somehow we can maybe jump through a series of religious hoops to earn God's favor. The the church has even done this over the course of time, whenever the reality of mankind's sinful nature has reared its ugly head. The church once upon a time was selling forgivenesses. Selling forgiveness through indulgences. They were prescribing ritualistic prayers and pilgrimages that would have some sort of effect. They were pointing the faithful to carry out certain sacrifices, punishments, penances, even after Christ had come. Well, the church has offered just about everything throughout the time under the sun as a means to deal with sin. But in our gospel lesson for today, we read and we hear firsthand what Jesus offers to you is the only solution to your sin. Jesus is the one who sets you free. And so, as we continue our discussion this morning, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That verse, what does that verse mean? In the four basic premises of our faith, it means this. First, we believe that our faith in Jesus involves a deep, involves a genuine understanding of remaining committed to Jesus no matter what comes our way, no matter what trials we face. Second, that true discipleship, true discipleship in Jesus involves one's whole sake, one's entire identity for the sake of sharing the gospel, for proclaiming Jesus above all else. Third, the truth of this world, it's not something relative that people in this world are seeking to find, but the absolute truth to us, for us, comes through Jesus Christ. And finally, finally, true freedom's not something that's based merely off of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Rather, it's given to you by Jesus on account of what he does for you 
and continues to do. Friends of Christ, let me illustrate this for a moment. A pastor one day attended a baseball game with his local Lutheran Thrivent chapter. And many from that congregation showed up that day for the pregame tailgate party in the stadium parking lot. Well, the pastor was asked to say a prayer before the meal in front of everyone, and he stood up and he simply prayed these words. Lord, we thank you for bringing us all together at this event. We give thanks to you as God and creator for all that you daily provide for us. We praise you for the wonderful weather, for the families that we are blessed to have, for this food that we are about to eat. In the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior, who died on the cross that we might have life and salvation, for he is the only way God has provided to know him. Amen. Well, then the people began moving through the food line, but one gentleman waited a few minutes and approached that pastor, and he said, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for that fine prayer you gave. I agreed with everything you said until you came to the conclusion in that part about Jesus Christ. Well, the pastor, a bit taken back, asked, well, what what was your concern about the closing of that prayer? The man responded, well, I thought your prayer should be more inclusive. I believe we're all trying to be with God. Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, we're all praying to God. We all hope to be in heaven. We're just expressing different views to God. You see, I'm a Jew myself. And I feel in our culture that we should be more tolerant of one another's views. After all, we're all praying to the same God. Well, the pastor was thinking in his head what he simply could not speak out loud. I thought this was a Lutheran event. What in the world is a Jewish man doing here at this event? Well, the pastor didn't respond that way. He responded, I hear you saying that there are different religions that have a ladder to get to God. That, that have the, we all have the same objective to be with God, yet you feel that, that Christianity, and Christians in particular, are too narrow-minded. The man agreed with him. The pastor said, well, first of all, I wanna thank you for the kindness in your voice as you shared your concerns. I do appreciate that. Second of all, I wanna thank you for sharing your Messiah with me. For I am but a Gentile dog who is thrilled to have the crumbs that have fallen from your Messiah's table. You have told me that you believe there are various religious ladders that people seek to have peace with God. Ladders going up to heaven are what people build, but they don't ever quite get us there. I'm sure you would agree that as an Orthodox Jew, that your ladder also falls a bit short. The man once again agreed, and the pastor then said, your Messiah Jesus He is the ladder from God to us. The Jewish man stood back, surprised for a moment, and after a moment said these words. You know, sir, I've never heard it said that way before. How you speak of Jesus as Messiah, it changes everything for me. You know, how we speak as the people of God about our Messiah, Jesus, it can indeed have the power to change many lives. You see, sometimes we can be too quick to to draw judgments upon others who may think a little different than us about God, who may not be in 100% agreement with what we personally believe. And I was reminded about this at our Lutheran District Pastors Convention this past week, reminded how sometimes we can pick on the differences that we have in others, And we overlook the commonality that we all have in Jesus. The commonality that before we know it, any witness opportunity can be overshadowed by our seemingly becoming defensive of our faith. And so instead of becoming defensive, Jesus would have us speak more about him. Would have us speak more about his name, the the truth that he brings, the freedom that he gives, the salvation that he alone offers as a free gift. For we never know how God may use that Sometimes when we're defensive, it can be an obstruction to God's love and grace and mercy. But when we open up and are positively affirmational, finding the commonality of Jesus and then being able to carry the discussion from there, we can be instruments and vessels of God's love and mercy. So brothers and sisters in Christ, in closing today, as we close this sermon series, we find ourselves 10 days away from another very important election in our country. And some of you may see our nation over the course of the past month as we've talked in need of great reform. Others of you may see that our nation is already in a process of reform. Well, in these final days ahead, as we continue to pray for our country, for our elected leaders, 
for the right that we have to vote, know this, that who you put your trust in has a lot to do and a lot to say about where you think truth and freedom come from. People of God, Obama will not bring America truth and freedom that will last. Romney will not bring truth or freedom to America that will last. In fact, no political leader will bring truth or freedom to America and to this world that will last. Jesus is the one who brings truth and freedom to you and to me. Jesus, the name above all names. And this day of reformation that we celebrate today, it's critical, it's vital. We're reminded of the Reformation experience that happened almost 500 years ago in the life of Martin Luther and in the life of the church that still continues to guide us and continues on today. We're reminded of our own constant need as a nation to look to Jesus. We're reminded to not boast in our own accomplishments, but to boast in Jesus. For celebrating this day of Reformation, it's so much more than standing up and recognizing and being aware of the willingness that Martin Luther had to stand up and confess that truth before God and before his church. Celebrating this day of Reformation, it's all about Jesus, who points us to the wonderful and awesome things that God does to preserve his truth among us. For kings and paupers, priests and monks, and martyrs throughout the centuries have given their lives to defend the truth of Jesus, to restore it, to proclaim it, to exalt it, to lift it up as the beacon of hope, the only beacon of hope and salvation that there is, that while you and I were still sinners, Christ dies and rises from the dead so that you and I may have a relationship with him. Jesus is the truth that is setting people free. Jesus is the one who is reforming hearts to this day. Jesus is the one who's bringing comfort to the fallen. The truth that we receive in Jesus points us to an empty cross, to an empty tomb. For Jesus is the name above all names. Jesus is the source of our forgiveness. Jesus comes to set you free. Jesus comes to set me free. Jesus is the truth and the heart of the Reformation. For we, our battle cry as Christians can be free in Christ, free in Christ. Thank God Almighty, we are free in Christ, amen?